Greetings and welcome back to part four of who is behind this crisis. In part three, we had looked at the similarities between the dream of Daniel chapter two that was given to King Nebuchadnezzar and that of Daniel's in chapter seven. And in it, I had mentioned about this little horn being the Antichrist. And I want to spend some time during this presentation showing the evidence of the claim that I made that this little horn, the Antichrist, is the Roman Catholic Church power. And so before I begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are living in very exciting times and all the world seems to be at unrest. wondering what's next. Many people are being persecuted and suffering through abuses. And so, Father, the world needs to know. They need to understand. And so, please, I ask that you would bless my mind and my words, that they would be of good use for someone who may be listening. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to begin looking at some key points that were brought out in chapter 7 of Daniel to help us to identify who this little horn or this Antichrist is. And in verse 8, the first characteristic we'll look at, it says that it will rise up among ten kingdoms, and we know that in history, the papal power did not come to supremacy until the dividing of Western Europe by these barbarian tribes. Number two, it says that we'll, it will uproot three kingdoms. This was in verse 8 also. And we know from history also with the support of Justinian, the ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire, the papal power uprooted three of these, these kingdoms because they were Aryan kingdoms, which meant that religiously they stood in opposition to the Catholic faith and they needed to be dealt with in order for them to have better control of the nation of Europe. The third bit of evidence we have is in verse 25 it says that he would think to change times and laws. Now, if you go to any Catholic works, their catechism or wherever you may look, you will see that this is true. They've eliminated the second commandment and they've divided the tenth to keep the Ten Commandments. You can do your own research as to why the second one would be eliminated. But also, too, there's a law that deals with time and that is the Sabbath day. And we're talking of God's law. And the statement I'm about to read to you is taken from the Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. It's a 1951 printing, and this is from page 50. It's done in a question and answer format. The question is, what is the third commandment? Which we know the fourth commandment in God's law is the Sabbath issue, but they've changed it to the third commandment. Answer, the third commandment is, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So she claims that she has the power to change God's holy day. So those who observe Sunday as God's day are observing a act of the Catholic Church. And I'll show you that to be true. Again, we'll stay in the Catholics um, convert to catechism. Question. 
How prove you that the church hath power to command feasts and holy days? Answer, by the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of. And therefore, they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. They claim that the Protestant world is contradicting themselves because the Protestant world founded itself on solo scriptura, God's word alone, and the Catholic Church knows there is no support for God changing his law. But the Catholic Church freely admits that they change God's holy day from the seventh to the first day. Let's look at the fourth evidence. This is found in verse 25. It says that he would speak great words against the Most High. The Most High is Jesus Christ. Now in our next study, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 13. Because Revelation, Revelation chapter 13 is, is in parallel with Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. And it, it is giving us more information in this book of prophecy as to who this great power is. And so I'm going to take verse 5 from there to bring in to help us to better understand what these great words are that they speak against the Most High. But again, I say next study we'll go into Revelation chapter 13 in more depth to uncover these things. It says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. So this same beast power in Revelation 13, we will show is the same in Daniel 7. And it's speaking blasphemies. What does the Bible say is blasphemies? Let's see. In Luke chapter 5 verse 21 it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Blasphemy is claiming that you can forgive sins. The Catholic Church claims that they can forgive your sins. This is given to God alone. What other signs do we have of blasphemy or definitions? Let's look at John chapter 10 and verse 33. The Jews answered him, this is Jesus, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. In answer to the claims of the church claiming to be God on earth, I'll have a link below in the description box that you can go to and read those for yourself, just for the sake of time. There's a link in the description box for you. Also, too, these great things include such things as purgatory. Purgatory is not found in the Bible, and yet it's a tradition. In Mark chapter 7, verse 13 says, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. Indulgences. Indulgences are a way that the Catholic Church uses to release someone from purgatory. Now salvation cannot be bought, it's a free gift. But the Catholic Church holds in high respect the traditions of the Church, even if they do not correspond with the Word of God. And now, when I share these things, I, I need to make a statement that I know and believe that there are good and true and honest Catholic Christians. My focus is on the Roman Catholic power, this system, and it has deceived many people. Number five, in verse 21 it says that it made war with the saints. And in verse 25 it says, for a time, times, and a dividing of times. This subject we're going to look at a lot more closely also in our study of Revelation chapter 13. And if you've ever watched the news, um, Pope Francis himself asked for forgiveness for the persecution of the saints. When the papal power had its 
full use and full authority from 538 until 1798, and those dates we're going to look at more closely, they persecuted those that they claimed to be heretics, in other words, those who that would not submit themselves um, to the control of the Roman Catholic Church, they put to death. And there is an estimated number of some 50 to 100 million people during this 1260 years of persecution that some know as the Dark Ages. Number six, in verse 24 it says that it is different than the other kingdoms. These other kingdoms were civil powers. This Roman Catholic system or the papal power, it is an ecclesiastical power and authority. But it used political entities through the influence of its uh, religion. Many of the leaders were uh, converted to Catholicism and therefore they were easy to control to fulfill the purposes of the church. Number seven, in verse, 20, in verse eight, it says that it would have a man at its head to speak for it, and this is the Pope. The Pope is the head of the church and speaks on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. The eighth evidence we find in verses seven and eight it says it would emerge from the pagan Roman Empire. When Rome first took over, when it defeated the, the Greek Empire, this was pagan Rome. It was a civil government. But once the government had moved from Rome in 330 and moved to Constantinople and turned the power over to the papacy after the defeating of the three Aryan nations, it was about the time of 538 AD, this turned the power over to the papal church. And so it emerged from the pagan Roman Empire. Now, these things are supported biblically, but in the past, there were many good people, and most of you are familiar with them. There were reformers, such as Martin Luther, John Calvin. It was unanimous between every reformer that there was something that they agreed upon and that it was that the papal power was the Antichrist of the Bible. There used to be a protest against the abuses and the falsehoods of the Catholic Church. What has happened today? Why is no one speaking up? We need to speak now because time is short and we have a responsibility. But I want to read a few quotes to you to support this fact that this little horn or the papal power as the Antichrist statement from Martin Luther. It says, nothing else than the kingdom of Babylon and a very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition but he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church while he yet sits in the church as if he were God. All these conditions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. John Calvin statement that he has made. Though it be admitted that Rome was once the mother of all churches, yet from the time when it began to be the seat of Antichrist, it has ceased to be what it was before. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. Now, it wasn't just the reformers alone, but I want to read something to you. It's taken from the Baptist Confession of Faith. And this was dated 1689. It says, The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church, in whom, by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order, or government, government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ. I'd like to read 
two more statements. Most of you know who Charles Spurgeon is, but this is a statement that he made. It is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist, and as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that be can be called by that name. If there were to be issued a hue and cry for Antichrist, we should certainly take up this church on suspicion, and it would certainly not be let loose again, for it so exactly the answers, and it for it so exactly answers the description. One more from a great reformer, John Wesley. In many respects, the Pope has an indisputable claim to those titles. He is, in an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is, too, properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his op op opposers and followers, destroyed innumerable souls, and will himself perish everlastingly. He it is that opposeth himself to the emperor, once his rightful sovereign, and that exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, commanding angels and putting kings under his feet, both of whom are called gods in scripture, claiming the highest power, the highest honor, suffering himself, not once only, to be styled God or vice God. Indeed, no less is implied in his ordinary title, Most Holy Lord, or Most Holy Father, so that he sitteth enthroned. In the temple of God mentioned in Revelation, declaring himself that he is God, claiming the prerogative which belong to God alone. John Wesley. And so we see that there is much evidence and support through Scripture and even from the past reformers who gave their lives for these truths not to be cast aside. But how does how has the church come to such powerful reign? Well, it's gaining its power back. And it uses something that the, the Catholic Church understood when this Reformation began. It needed to form a counter-reformation. And this counter-reformation was formed in the early 1500s. And it was under the Jesuit order it was organized and formed by St. Ignatius Loyola. And I want to read a bit of the oath that the Jesuits must take. And I'm going to leave a link for that oath. I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but I'll leave a link to that oath in its entirety in the description box. But just part, this part I want to read to you to help you to understand what's going on today and why we have this great crisis, and what's the cause of it all. This is part of the oath. Now, in the presence of Almighty God, the blessed Virgin Mary, the blessed Michael the Archangel, the blessed Saint John the Baptist, the holy Apostle Saint Peter and Saint Paul, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly Father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's vice, vice regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or universal church throughout the earth, and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing, given to His Holiness by my Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear the words, listen closely. He hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without His sacred confirmation, and that they may safely be destroyed. That is the purpose of the Jesuits. And that is the work that the Roman Catholic Church wants to be accomplished. She wants to be in power again. Because behind her, who's on that throne? 
This was told us in Isaiah chapter 14. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Satan, through his throne, is trying to bring the world into submission to himself. He uses governments. He uses whatever means he can to establish that. There's nothing too sacred. So we need not look any further than the work of that throne. There may be political events going on. There may be climate changes. But you can see all of this is focusing to one certain end. And in our next study, we're going to look a little bit at this climate change. What does that mean? What does that have to do with us today? We're going to look at showing that these, this Roman power from Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 is that Roman power in Revelation chapter 13. And in chapter 13, it's going to tell us the events that we see here very near are going to be fulfilled that we see in Revelation chapter 13. It will tell us what's to come and what we should be prepared for. Let us close with a word of prayer. My Father in heaven, I pray for the people of this world, Lord, that you would open their eyes and that they could see the love that you have for each individual through the gift of your Son and what it cost you and your Son for this to happen. I pray that your love would touch the hearts of the people of this world. And Father, we can't change the events that are going to take place. You will be coming soon, and I just pray that there will be many prepared to receive you. And so, Lord, give us strength and give us courage, and may our hearts be open to you and look heavenward, for our redemption draweth nigh. Thank you for the hope that you give us of your soon return, and this will all be come to an end. Lord, may your will be done. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.